Hi there, my name's Graeme Healy, and I just want to do a little bit of an introduction on uh, this, um, the actual clustering of um, um, sacroiliac joint um, tests. Now, <clears throat> before I get started, there's a little bit of explanation uh, regarding the statistical um, analysis of uh, what works and what doesn't work and how it works and everything. And um, probably the best... Uh, or one of the best references I found is uh, Dr. Vizenak's orthopedic assessment book. And I'll just read a little bit of bottom line information out of that to set uh, the, the mood for when we actually do the uh, sacroiliac testing. And there's, there's five tests and uh, we'll go into that in video later on. But first of all, I thought I'd give you a little bit of an introduction because um, the bottom line is with the um, orthopedic testing, is they become uh, more um, valid, I suppose, from a statistical point of view, um, with grouping or what they call clustering the tests. Now, <clears throat> when you get into the clustering and the analysis of clustering and everything else like that, what I suggest you do is just uh, overview how they get there uh, by statistical mathematics uh, it is quite, uh, well, I've found it quite complicated. I don't know about anyone else. Um, but we don't have to be a, a work out the statistics ourselves. We just accept the, uh, um, the particular tests that have been done and the analysis that have been done and published on, say, PubMed or uh, such studies that we accept as uh, uh, evidence uh, that these particular tests are, have a certain validity. Now, <clears throat> there's a couple of ratios in the uh, uh, normal distribution curve, which I'll, I won't go into detail, but I'll just explain the bottom line. First of all, uh, this is straight out of uh, Dr. Vizenak's uh, orthopedic um, assessment book, and it's on pages uh, 6, 7, 8, and 9, if you want to reference that. We'll have that uh, uh, Dr. Vizenak's book reference at the end of the video. Now, likelihood ratios. Now, <clears throat> a likelihood ratio greater than one indicates an increased probability that the disorder is present. A bigger number is better. A negative, that's a positive likelihood ratio, a negative, po uh, negative likelihood ratio less than one indicates a, dec a de decrease, sorry, a decreased probability that disorder is present. The smaller number is better. So when you see at the, at the bottom of the, um, uh, the actual orthopedic test, you'll see, uh, say, LR positive, LR negative, SR in, SR out. These, what these uh, ratio figures mean uh, is that they've been tested, <coughs> excuse me, they're tested statistically on a normal distribution curve, many, many tests, 40, 50 tests, 100 tests, by qualified people and they've come up with these reliability ratios. And what you find is that the ratio of reliability goes up more so when you do more tests in a cluster. So that's why we do them in a cluster. Now just, <clears throat> just reading the bottom line with the likelihood uh, ratio explanation, uh, if you go over 10, I won't go through the lot of them, you can read that yourself uh, when you get Dr. Vizenak's book, or um, 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 Martin Harris has done a very good summary in our lecture notes on um, sensitivity and specificity. Read through those notes as well. Now, if it's greater than 10, a positive likelihood ratio is greater than 10, it's significant, often conclusive, change to post-test probability of diagnosis. And likewise, um, that would be in a negative uh, likelihood ratio, it's under 0.1. Okay, so research shows, I've underlined a few things, which I'll just give the bottom line. We don't want to go on too long with this. Research shows increased diagnostic accuracy when multiple clustered tests are performed in conjunction with detailed patient history. I'll just repeat that. Research shows increased diagnostic accuracy, and that's what we're trying to do is diagnose when multiple clustered tests are performed in conjunction with detailed patient history. You've got to tie the two together. Patients will often tell you what's wrong with them. 
that's a fact. Okay, now sensitivity and specificity. Uh, again, uh, I'll just read out what the definition of sensitivity is. The probability of a positive test among patients with a disease. The highly sensitive tests are best to rule, rule out the disease. So in other words, in general, as tests become more sensitive, it becomes less specific and vice versa. So I'll just go through the sensitivity again. The sensitivity, the sensitivity of a test is how you rule out the disease. All right. Now the specificity is how you rule in the disease. So the definition of specificity is a probability of a negative test among patients without the disease. So sensitivity is a definition of the probability of a positive test among patients with the disease. And the specificity is a definition, pro definition probability of a negative test among patients without the disease. So sensitivity rules out the disease and specificity rules in the disease. So, um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, that's it. And uh, we'll just go to the page here and uh, I'll just read this out. Cl clinicians should cluster their special tests to improve the accuracy of diagnosis, choose a minimum of three tests. Of that, you can perform and interpret well for a given condition. And as an example, uh, on page uh, nine, we've got uh, cervical radiculopathy, and uh, Dr. Viznak here does four tests, a positive upper limb, cervical rotation test, uh, positive distraction test, positive cervical compression test, and then you'll see that the sensitivity and specificity, the more tests you go, the greater these figures are, and positive likelihood ratios are all written down there accordingly. So <clears throat> finally, I'll just finish with this. Um, uh, the cl the clinic, what, what we call entitled the cl uh, clinical prediction rules. Clinical prediction rules are designed to improve clinical decision making and assist practitioners in diagnosis, prognosis and treatment planning. Uh, the CPRs provide practitioners with a powerful diagnostic information from the history and physical examination that may serve as accurate decision, decision making surrogate for a more expensive diagnostic check test. In many cases, a good history, this is very important, in many cases, a good history and exam are more diagnostic than an MRI. That's interesting. You get these tests right and you'll minimize uh, radiation exposure to clients just having to get an X-ray all the time. That doesn't necessarily give you an accurate diagnosis in many cases. Combine multiple diagnostic, diagnostic tests with clinical understanding of disease processes to improve accuracy and a treatment effectiveness. Um, okay, that's it. So we'll, the next stage of this video, uh, we'll go through and do the, the um, um, sacroiliac uh, clustered testing uh, by uh, Mark Lensat and uh, et al. And we'll have a okay, chat to you further from there. We're going to go through the series of um, SI joint tests um, and the first one is sacral springing. So we put our hand on the apex of the sacrum, apply pressure and spring. And we just see if there's any movement in that joint and the sacral joint there's a very small amount of movement that only moves about one or two degrees at most and the object of the exercise is to reproduce the pain. Now Alan just like to go on your side please facing that way. Thank you. Now just bring that knee up a little bit. Now I'm going to compress the hip and in doing that we compress one, compress and compress, compress a couple of times. And what we're trying to do is find or reproduce the pain or find movement in the SI and hip joint. Okay. Alan, just lying on your back, please. 
Now we put both um, palms on the ASIS and we're going to separate here, separate the pelvis through, through the pubis. Again, that will cause a little bit of movement in the SI joint. All right, we're doing that. Okay, All right now we'll do the Gainsland's or Gainsland's test, where we bring up. It looks like a Thomas test, where we bring up the knee, and with Alan's other leg, we gently lean it over the side. Now just relax, Sir Alan. Now I'm going to apply pressure here and extend and try and reproduce the pain. Now, of course, if there's SI joint pain, there could be hip involved here as well. And the iliopsoas will be stretched or um, if it's a, uh, in uh, a contraction, we'll have uh, some issues as well. But the main thing we're looking at is SI joint reproduction of pain. All right, I'll just put that one down. Okay, now we'll lift this knee up and straighten this leg. Thank you. Lift this knee up. Now what I'm going to do is the uh, femur compression test here. Put the palm underneath the gluteal muscle and I press the femur down through the hip joint. So we're just pressing down again, trying to reproduce any pain either in the hip or SI joint. There we go. Okay, thanks Alan. Now <clears throat> this, I will go into greater detail on the tape where I'll go into the um, likelihood ratios and the sensitivity and specificity ratios and we will put that on the screen as well. Okay, thanks for watching. Thanks Alan.